25 minutes before 11 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. Stephen P. Hinshaw is on the phone. Oh my gosh, he's got an interesting story to share with you, and it is his own story, uh, his and his dad's, his and his family's even. Uh, Stephen is a professor of psychology at the University of California in Berkeley. He's the vice chair of psychology at the University of California in San Francisco. He's a researcher, a contributor to the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, the Washington Post, and it goes on and on and on. The book is called Another Kind of Madness, A Journey Through the Stigma and Hope of Mental Illness. It is a memoir that chronicles his father's recurring mental illness. And again, Stephen P. Hinshaw, thank you for coming on the air. This sounds like a, a s deeply personal story you're about to share with us. So thank you for, uh, for your courage in deciding to do that and putting it into a book. Good morning, Stephen. Oh, it's great to be on. Thanks so much. And, and uh, you're welcome. And I think why I consider this an act of courage, by the way, is because people will benefit from the fact that you're sharing something that many people probably would prefer to keep a secret. Well, that's the big problem. I mean, here we are in 2017. Back in the earlier part of the 20th century, you didn't put cancer in the obituary of your relative who died from it. It was a shameful really? disease. You brought it on because you probably didn't have enough moral fortitude. Now, cancer is a cause, breast cancer is a cause. A couple of Sundays every fall, the NFL behemoths are wearing pink knee socks to support breast cancer. But mental health issues, mental illness, hasn't reached that status yet. It's still shameful. It's still probably that you had bad parents or back in the day were possessed by evil spirits or didn't have the strength to, to snap out of your depression. And so my story is, in some ways, well, why would there be a story? I grew up in the Midwest, in Columbus, Ohio. Right. My, dad, my dad was a philosophy professor at Ohio State. We had an idyllic life. We had season tickets to OSU football games. But he would disappear three months or six months or at one point a year at a time. Nothing was ever said. It was a total mystery. I knew something dangerous was out there. But what I didn't know was his lead doctor had said, if you ever tell your children, my sister and me, about your serious mental illness and your hospitalizations, they'll be permanently destroyed. Let me ask you something, and then I want to ask you specifically about your story, of course. But it, yeah. you, you were kind of comparing yesterday to today uh, yeah. with cancer, and mental illness probably has to go through that same kind of um, changes. Uh, I had no clue, by the way, about the cancer part of it. But I'm, I'm wondering if not only did we not recognize certain things as mental illness, but did we recognize some things as or identify some things as mental illness that were really just normal behaviors? Well, see, this is the, the, the big issue here. With cancer, we can do a, a pathology test and we've got objective measures to know if your cells are proliferating. Now, we're doing a lot better research on mental health these days, but there's still no lab test or blood test or brain scan that can definitively tell you. It's a matter of judging behaviors and emotions. So, some of the critics out there say, well, how do you know if it's just being sad or sadder than usual or yeah. major depression, yeah. or excited or more excited than usual, or a full manic episode? With evidence-based diagnosis, you don't do this in a 10-minute visit. It takes some time and a good history, and we're getting better objective markers. We can make a diagnosis of mental illness, and the paradox of paradoxes is, despite the shame and stigma, if we give people with mental health conditions good evidence-based treatments, the average effect is larger than the average effect for most physical treatments you get for, for your medical illnesses. But people are ashamed to admit or don't have the right insurance coverage. We still don't have parity to treat mental health the way it should be. But when we do, people can recover. It's not incurable, which is what the stereotype too often is. And the, and, and the person that is diagnosed with the mental illness, at least these days, uh, that uh, I have heard that sometimes they have to go on medication. How do you instill on that patient they have to take the medication and 
but if 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 they don't take it they're going to revert back and do more harm to themselves and their loved ones right so for certain more severe forms of mental illness medications can be extremely effective even life-saving more often than not individual psychotherapy or family therapy group support can be uh, really uh, important adjuncts to medication or sometimes for many anxiety disorders they're actually better than medications but in both cases the individual and the family have to realize that this isn't just anxious thoughts that come and go or a sad mood here and there these are serious problems that can get chronic if they're not treated and so part of the issue is working with the individual and family to to recognize this isn't just that again you've got weak moral fiber and and if you just tried harder you wouldn't hear the voices or you could lift your mood up it may take treatment just the way that treating cancer or lung disease would but this is a big struggle because we still don't have the recognition or the insight that some of these emotional problems are really signs of a mental illness tell us about your father and um, if i could ask a specific question how did his mental illness manifest itself maybe you never witnessed it but did he did he become uh, combative did he become sad what what were his manifestations so when he was 16, obviously well before I was born, I learned this from talking with him. Once he came out of the closet and told me, and I learned it from other family members, back in Southern California where he grew up, he was convinced in the mid-30s that he had attained the power of flight. If he lifted up his arms, they'd become wings. And this would send a message to the three world leaders to stop Hitler and the fascists. Well, in hindsight, he was undergoing a rapid escalating manic episode he was grandiose he jumped from the roof of the family home mm -hmm. on this first attempted flight survived miraculously was placed in a kind of snake pit backward mental hospital for six months but he spontaneously recovered now that should have been a clue that he didn't have what he was misdiagnosed with schizophrenia a more chronic form of psychotic behavior but he had manic depressive illness or what we today call bipolar disorder terrible uh, elated manias and depressions and then periods of long normal functioning in between it wasn't until i went home for my first spring break from college dad pulled me aside started to tell me about his life went against the doctor's orders and i helped him over the next couple of years get an accurate diagnosis mm. of bipolar disorder finally he got the right treatments and he lived uh, for for many years after that pretty much symptom free wow wow so, now, so it's, an, it's sort of an incredible story when he was in grad school at princeton studying philosophy he worked with bertrand russell and albert einstein but that didn't prevent him from spending six more months in a mental hospital right after he got his phd because wow. he thought he could predict the end of world war ii some illnesses like bipolar illness cycle up and down and until you get the right diagnosis and treatment uh the person can suffer for a long time so if he's in a, if he's in a psych psychiatric hospital for that long how come they couldn't help him because back in the 30s and 40s and 50s there really weren't the mood stabilizing medications that now can really help people with bipolar disorder there wasn't any family support <clears throat> it was kind of lock the door and throw away the key and people didn't really visit except one of his brothers when he was in philadelphia in a hospital outside of princeton and now that we have done 50 60 years of much better psychological and psychiatric research uh -huh. there's evidence-based medicines and forms of individual and family therapy that can ri we don't have cures for mental illness yet but we can put a dent in the symptoms and many people right. can recover but again the shame and stigma even prevent people from recognizing or seeking treatment yes. and that's the paradox we have to fix and go ahead and uh, way back then they they would the the doctors would go in and and they would say there's something wrong with the brain so they would do some kind of uh, uh brain surgery uh, things on the patients they would do the uh, uh shock therapy and they just didn't know what they were doing well <clears throat> lobotomies became common in the 30s and 40s pretty radical to dissect your brain or take a section out and we didn't really know now if you've got an intractable seizure disorder brain surgery can can save your life interestingly despite one flew over the cuckoo's nest if you've got really serious depression that doesn't lift with therapy or medication 
well-placed electroshock therapy, electroconvulsive therapy, can be life-saving. But back in the day when my dad was younger, these treatments were used indiscriminately and sometimes punitively. And we need, part of the other problem with stigma is, mental health research doesn't get the same funding that so-called physical health research does. We need to keep moving the dial so that many more people can get access to the care they deserve. I want to make sure we are fair to the book, but I do have a question about your expertise, and then we'll take a break, and then we'll talk about the book. Um, so that we're fair about the book. I want the people, to, the listeners, to know what the book is about. But in society, when there's a news story about somebody who's done something heinous, a murder or a rape yep. or something, and then later on the, the person who gets arrested for those things is diagnosed with some kind of a mental illness, Socially, we do not even care. We, we say, you know what, you, are, you killed somebody and I don't care what caused you to do it. I'm not going to forgive you. you. You deserve to be locked up. Now, whether that's right or wrong is not what I want to ask you. What I want to ask you is this. If that is true, that there is a, a mental illness that you can pin the bad behavior on, is it possible for somebody else's sake, to nip it in the bud before it ever gets to that point. Well, this is the big issue. Most so-called adult forms of serious mental illness, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, which can be, if untreated, sometimes linked to violence, if you catch the symptoms early, childhood or teen years, early adult years, you can nip it in the bud. But if you wait until the symptoms have fully formed, it's much harder to treat. I should also point out that despite these gruesome headlines, school shootings, etc., most people with serious mental illness are not violent at all. And in fact, people with mental illness are five times more likely to be victimized by violent crime than to ever perpetrate it. But that's not what you believe from the stereotypes. Mm. So the stereotypes are wrong, and with treatment and early intervention, we can really nip the, the, the symptoms in the bud and not get to that point. Is, is mental illness sometimes caused or aggravated by movies, video games, things, uh, books, uh, e even overhearing a st or reading a story in the newspaper? Well, most of the serious forms of mental illness we're talking about, serious depression, bipolar illness, schizophrenia, PTSD, there's clearly a genetic liability. Some people are more vulnerable than others. But maltreatment or trauma, or sometimes the kind of contagion of uh, reading difficult stuff in the media, clearly for some forms of psychotic illness, uh -huh. smoking marijuana in your teen years potentiates that genetic vulnerability. So the, it's like cancer. It's like heart disease. Mm -hmm. It's partly in the genes. It's partly the experiences you have. And these are complicated, what we call multifactorial illnesses. So let's take a little break. Uh, you did mention that your your dad in his younger years were was somehow connecting uh, a, a, some kind of a delusion. I'll use a word. I just don't even know what I'm talking about here, but I'm, I'll just use it. So you're right. You're exactly right. Some kind of a delusion that he could stop Hitler by, by flying. Mm -hmm. um, so Let's take a little break and find out what's in the book. Um, the book, again, is called Another Kind of Madness. It's written by Stephen P. Hinshaw. He has written a very uh, honest and um, just an honest book about his dad and, and about the, the experience he had as his father's son. Can you imagine your dad's gone for a year? Yeah, and, and that's oh my, sad. Oh, my gosh. Okay, we're going to take, take a little break, and we'll be right back. Minutes before 11 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. Um, we're talking to uh, Stephen Hinshaw on the phone. Uh, did I ask him who, where he is? I, I think he's in California. Um, and his book is called Another Kind of Madness. We're talking about mental illness. His father um, had serious mental illness. Is your, your dad has passed away? My dad passed away some years ago. He was a very brilliant and warm philosopher who, again, had studied with Einstein and Russell in grad school, yet his brilliance was matched sometimes by very disturbed and disturbing behavior because of undiagnosed and untreated bipolar disorder. So how do we, as the loved one of somebody, know... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not asking about the book, but I'm just, I guess, one question about that. How do, how could we in today's world know, like, for example, we know PTSD is um, a reality. It used to be called shell shock. Now it's a reality, and it may or may not have anything to do with combat. It could be a car accident. It could be, it could be anything. 
it could be sexual assault. It could be a, a natural disaster or an accident. Some people are probably wired genetically to be more prone to PTSD reactions. But if the life stress the trauma is severe enough, many, if not most people, will get a set of reactions, the flashbacks, the re-experiencing, some of the numbness and the startle that can be really debilitating. Again, with good treatment, sometimes medication, often uh, intensive forms of talk therapy and behavioral therapy to rehearse relaxation, etc., people with PTSD can lead very productive lives, but you have to recognize it and you have to get the treatment. Uh, you have a quote from the actress uh, Glenn Close on the back of your book. Uh, how did she and you get together with this? Well, her family has very serious mental illness. One day, five years ago, I was walking across the UC Berkeley campus where I teach after a lecture, and I got a phone call, 212 Area Code, New York City. I picked up the phone, and the caller rec uh, identified herself as Glenn Close. I thought probably somebody was pulling my leg, but it was Glenn who said, I know about your work in mental health and stigma. Would you be on my scientific board? So she and I are now collaborating with all of her staff to, to work with high school students not in therapy groups, but to discuss mental health and stigma in what we call let's, let's erase the stigma clubs, to change attitudes of young people moving forward. It's really important work. Wow. All right. I love that. So tell me, tell me about your dad. You, you ready to give us some information about him. And, and um, when you wrote the book, did you hold back at all or did you just let it all go? I kind of had to go for it. Now, remember, my first 18 years, because his doctors are very clear that my sister and I would be destroyed if we ever learned about his serious mental illness, it was a shock to me when he pulled me into that study of his, my first spring break from college. We talked a few times a year for the rest of his life, for the next 25 years. I became, not surprisingly, interested in psychology and working with kids and doing mental health. And then over the years, I've also realized We've also got to combat these attitudes and the stigma because my dad really suffered from it. If he hadn't had tenure at Ohio State as a brilliant philosophy professor, he would have lost his job with his irrational as he got in the classroom sometimes. What was we he doing? Need to, well, he would uh, accuse students of not following the great philosophers, and he'd yell out at faculty meetings that people weren't following his ideas. When you get sufficiently manic, it's not just pleasant grandiosity anymore. You can get pretty irrational. But with treatment, mood-stabilizing medications and therapy, most people with bipolar disorder can turn their lives around dramatically. And this is why we have to overcome the shame and stigma. We can't afford yeah. to uh, yeah. be That's like we were with cancer back in the 1940s and 50s. Yeah, that is a really great message right there. I, I absolutely believe you. Um, what, did your father have depression? Was um, you, you, He got angry. Did he come physical angry or just voice, vocal? Vocal... There was an incident my mother told me about once I was in graduate school when my sister and I were very young. They were watching the big black and white TV in Columbus, a nice evening together, but mm -hmm. Dad had been getting up early and having unusual ideas. The, the singer on the variety show he thought was sending messages to him, and he basically ordered my mother in the car and they drove a hundred miles in the middle of the night to Cincinnati with my sister and I asleep in our beds so the singer could deliver the messages to him. My mom went along not knowing what to do, hoping to talk him back into turning the car around and, and before uh, my, my, my little sister and I woke up. Family members have to deal sometimes with pretty irrational or very depressed behavior, people with bipolar disorder, and my mother never received support at all. There was no family therapy back then. This is what we can combat. What could my father have said to me when I was young? Anything would have been better than nothing, because what kids do when they know something's wrong in the family but nobody's talking about it is what? They start to blame themselves. So. I focused on school and sports. I thought maybe if I kept quiet, maybe Dad would never go away again. And I've had my share of depressions through my life. I've got a little bit of Dad's genetic vulnerability. But once I've opened up and been able to get therapy myself, I've been able to, I hope, turn the corner and try to convince people that shaming mental illness is getting us nowhere. If we treat it, we can end this cycle. Can you talk to the person listening that recognizes your father, maybe not your father physically or by name, but maybe they recognize themselves, maybe they recognize their own father? What would you mm -hmm. say to that person? I would say that 
everybody goes through ups and downs. Deciding what's normal ups and downs and what's bipolar disorder is a tough call. If there's doubt and if your life has been shaken or your family member's life has been shaken and distorted by mood episodes, get to a psychologist or psychiatrist. Get to a support group. There's all kinds of support groups for people dealing with mental illness these days. The National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI, many others. And get an evaluation. See, is it worth getting treatment? Is medication indicated or not? Hiding it and pretending it'll go away, the head in the sand approach is not going to work. And it's very, very uh, courageous of you, sir, to share your story because you will never know how many people you help just by opening up. This is what we have to do. Celebrities come forward with cancer and, of course, for the National Parkinson Society, Michael J. Fox and Muhammad Ali have been, before Muhammad Ali passed away, the national spokespeople. But we still don't have Glenn Close as a noteworthy example with a mental illness in her family and her coming forward. We still don't have advocates. We still don't have enough everyday stories. Yeah. What got cancer out into the open? You know, it wasn't the celebrities. It was everyday stories of heroism and triumph. You know, I was listening to Jim Carrey the other day, and please, I, I don't want anybody to misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not a psychiatrist, and I'm not trying to say he's got mental illness issues, but he reminded me of the latter days of Robin Williams. Yeah. And the and I'm thinking about what you're saying right there. If we could have somebody, they would have to admit it. And that maybe maybe that stigma issue is the reason we don't get them step, stepping forward. If Robin Williams could come back from the dead, then I guess we'd have somebody. But but yeah. if, but if somebody who is in Robin Williams' shoes the year or two before he killed himself would say, you know what, that's me. I got to do something, and I got to speak so other people can be helped. I think it's it's a matter of. Uh, notorious people and celebrity people and your next door neighbor mental illness isn't just superheroes and super vi villains it's our daughters it's our fathers it's mm. it's our siblings and, and workmates if we can encourage people to come out of that closet and speak up it can't be uh, buried uh, as a national issue the way it has been for way too long i think you've just saved some Gosh. lives i think you're saving <laughs> yes. lives i really do you're saving relationships i believe this is an important subject and you've written an important book to, to address the subject and in a very personal way. I have a copy of Another Kind of Madness. It's written by Stephen P. Hiddenshaw. Call me if you want the copy I have. The rest of us have to go buy it. I only have about 10 seconds, Stephen. Can you give us a website? Uh, website, www.stephen, with a P-H, HinshawAuthor.com. StephenHinshawAuthor.com. All my books are there, and including Another Kind of Madness. Uh, and I'm, I'm guessing it's Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and everything. Thanks. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, the works. Thank you, you Stephen. We'll be right back. This is W.O.